Thank you, Anthony. Give Anthony a little breather there before we hit our opening hymn and candle lighting. Um, do want to mention a very special thank you to uh, Carol and to all of our trustees. We had a uh, furnace down for the lower level here blow a hole in the side. And so we were told that we couldn't join uh, in person here, even though it's only Kathy and I, because of possible carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, so I am very glad to be here because uh, somehow the trustees, with all of these supply bottleneck problems and everything else, um, they were able to uh, get Cerner heating in here. And we have a brand new furnace downstairs. And, uh, you know, it's going to be free of charge because we're church. So we don't have to worry about that, of course. Uh, but we are here in the building. So trustees, thank you very much for uh, being on top of that so quickly. Uh, so now uh, let us turn to uh, Anthony for our opening hymn as I light the uh, two candles over here in our, in our chancel. Thank you, Anthony. And we'll now post our, our call to worship. And the way we need to do this is everyone will remain muted, but we do hope that you will follow along in your own homes. There's a time lapse between all of our responses and it just comes across as noise and not as response. And Anthony will do the part of the people for all of us to be heard. So the call to worship. Let all people be attentive for the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Everything around us proclaims God's majesty. Let us reverence the creator who has made all things good. Day and night, God is at work among all of us, whoever we are. We are drawn together into one body, the church. As we commune with God, we know we need one another. Let us honor the good and holy that is in all people. Jesus ministered to his people and also to their conquerors. He reached out to everyone, setting us an example to follow. Our faith in Jesus inspires us to seek union with friend and stranger. We will embrace them as loved by Christ. And now within this week of prayer for Christian unity, on this ecumenical Sunday, the Sunday within that week, we now have the privilege of coming together in our unison prayer as part of this one congregation, part of the one body of Christ, continuing to do the work of Jesus in the world, our unison prayer. 
on this holy day of worship. We come together to help make sense of our lives. We look to your word, O God, as a source of understanding and empathy. Revive our souls so that our hearts and minds may rejoice in your presence among us and also beyond us. Cleanse us of false pride and enlighten us with your truth. Liberate us from self-imposed restrictions. During this week of prayer for Christian unity, help us to heal the divisions of our faith. Grant us the humility to see the presence of Christ in those who worship with us and those who worship in other churches. Help us to fulfill Jesus's prayer that they may all be one. Amen. And Anthony, if you'd now lead us in the Gloria Patri, which you are encouraged to sing as loudly as you like at your homes, but sadly remaining muted. <laughs> Let's turn it over to Donna for our first reading. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Thank you, Donna. 
And now it's time for our special message for the children, um, for those who are young at heart. And uh, I don't know, I don't see all the, the pictures there, but if there are any young people with us, wonderful. Uh, and if not, hopefully when this is shared uh, online and also on FCAP, maybe they will uh, join us at that time. So what I have here is something we all recognize. It's a simple letter and it doesn't matter to whom it's addressed or anything like that. But over here in the corner, you have the one from whom it is sent. And right here in the center, you have to whom it is sent. And then over here is the stamp. And the stamp is what promises that this person will get this letter to this person. And so when you pay for that stamp and you put your stamp on your envelope, and you know, now with these uh, forever stamps, I don't even know what a stamp costs anymore. I go and I buy a book. I have no idea what a stamp costs. But whether you buy a stamp a long time ago and bought maybe 200 of them and can still use them as the price goes up, the post office honors this stamp so that this person sending to this person can trust the promise of the post office that because there is this stamp, the post office is saying, I promise that I will deliver this letter. You know, you're probably too young. I hope you're too young uh, to have a credit card if you're a, a child. Uh, but a credit card is this idea that you simply take out a piece of plastic from your wallet. You go into a store. You can buy whatever you want, you know, whether it be, you know, a pack of gum or, you know, it could be some big expensive, you know, flat screen television. And you take this little piece of plastic out and you give it to the person at the store. And that little piece of plastic gets you a pack of gum or a big screen television, all because when you have that credit card, you are promising to that store that I will pay for this through the credit card. So you are making a promise that this isn't given to me for free, like our brand new furnace down in the basement. Instead, I will pay for this when I get my credit card bill. It is our promise that we will pay. And those kind of ideas of promises, they're important because sometimes people don't keep their promises. Sometimes it can happen by accident. Sometimes people just do not want to keep their promises and that's what we call a lie. And we don't want to be liars. We want to be people who keep our promises. And you know, sometimes we can maybe lie or just forget a promise. But you know, the amazing thing about God is, is God doesn't forget his promises or ignore them. God will always keep his promises. When we get to the gospel today, we're going to hear an amazing story about Jesus going to his hometown synagogue, which is like his hometown church. And when he gets there, he picks a particular passage from Isaiah to read. And that passage says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And the Lord has anointed me. And the Lord will send me. And so Jesus says, after he goes to sit down and everyone is looking at him, he says, today in your presence, the scripture is fulfilled. You know, if Isaiah is writing, say, somewhere like 500 years before Jesus, it may take half a millennium for God to fulfill his promise, but God will always fulfill his promise. When Jesus came into the world 500 years after that prophet and said, today that scripture is fulfilled in me, God remembered his promise and fulfilled it. Sometimes we can think that, you know, because it takes so long or, you know, we, we have to wonder, is God really hearing what we're asking? Is God really understanding what he says when he promises us these things? And we have to trust that God hears and that God will fulfill his promise, even if it's a little bit longer than we had thought. Jesus came 500 years after Isaiah, but God always keeps his promises. And for that means we can trust in God. No matter how bad it is, no matter how scary it is, no matter how confusing it is, we can always trust in God's promises. And maybe that can inspire us to be truthful people as well. People who keep our word, people who definitely do not lie, but people who count our word as like a special gift, a treasure that we, we cherish, and that our word means something, that our promises mean something. So may Jesus help us to be people who are truthful as we worship and honor a God who always keeps his promises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now back to uh, Anthony for our choir anthem, which is the gift of love.
Thank you. And it is now um, our time for shared prayer. And let us begin by uh, praying for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. We pray for the 343 million people infected by the COVID-19 virus worldwide, nearly 69 million of them right here in our country, and really the astounding number of 860,000 people who have died in our nation to date from COVID. Uh, so we want to do the best that we can, and that's why we are asking you to worship from home, and just Kathy and I are here in the building. We're doing our best uh, to give people this uh, chance uh, to stay as well as possible uh, for as long as possible, because uh, they are saying this is a peak time, and the numbers are hopefully starting to come down. We're trying to give our first responders and our hospital professionals um, the chance to deal with those who are sick. And so uh, I thank you all for joining us now in this format. It's not the same as being in person, uh, but we are doing this for our good and for the good of others, which is extremely a Christian idea. So we pray for those who are infected and we pray that we may remain well also. Also, as tensions escalate and war uh, becomes more possible, we pray for peace in Eastern Europe and Ukraine uh, when Russia has got their troops massed at the borders. Uh, we pray that somehow war may be avoided through diplomacy and that somehow we can find a way to live together in this world. And all of those threats make this Sunday so much more meaningful, this idea of uh, ecumenical Sunday, of, of coming together for a week of prayer for Christian unity. Maybe as church people, as churches, we can set the example that even though we are so different, uh, we believe differently, we worship differently, we think of God differently, that we can have enough respect for each other instead of complaining about others and denigrating others for their faith in Jesus, maybe we can respect that. And maybe that kind of unity without uniformity is an example that we can live and preach uh, so that others may also imitate it and we have less war and maybe more diplomacy. Now, if you'd like to unmute yourself before we actually get to our prayer list that is printed and you all have from the bulletin, would anybody like to share your prayers by unmuting yourself? Uh, John? I'd like to add uh, Richard and Sue to the prayer list. Richard has been diagnosed with advanced cancer and he is gonna be undergoing an aggressive chemotherapy and radiation treatment to, in Sue's words, hopefully prolong his life. So for Richard and Sue, absolutely. Would anybody else like, yep, uh, Lisa? Um, I just want to uh, ask for prayers since during our church cabinet meeting, it came up that there was a, an unhoused person sleeping in our doorway of the chapel and then has since moved on. And I just felt such a burden for that person and, and people that don't have shelter when I go outside, it's just bitterly, bitterly cold. So just prayers for people that don't have, don't have permanent housing. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm not cutting anyone off. I just wanna segue with that um, because um, I have sent a, a, a letter to other local congregations. There is a woman from the Hatfield Church, very faithful, uh, every Sunday attender. Uh, she's been living in the home of another woman for nine years now, and that woman is getting ready to sell her home, um, and this other woman who lived there um, is going to be without a place to live. Uh, she has entered her name in subsidized housing uh, from Massachusetts, I mean from like East Hampton to Greenfield. Uh, she is also eligible for senior housing. Uh, but she has asked that I ask um, our churches if anyone knows of anywhere um, that they're renting a small um, apartment um, for not very much money. She doesn't have much. And the reason that it's so desperate is that she needs to move out by the end of March. And if she does not have a place to uh, live, she has to go to a homeless shelter. Uh, so this woman is literally, um, you know, nothing. She has not, not very much money. Um, so if anybody knows of uh, someone who has a, a place to rent, or if you have any kind of connections that can help her in some way to find housing, it would be deeply appreciated. And because of the, you know, the, the, the nature of this request, if you reach out to me, I can then pass your request on uh, to this member from the Hatfield Church. And I've shared this with uh, other local congregations as well. Um, are there any other prayers that you would like to share at this point? 
please put the Kilo family um, in your prayers. Jean's daughter passed away. Jean's daughter. Okay. Um, sorry to hear that. We'll keep the Kilo family in our prayers. Any other prayers? Okay, seeing no other prayers, um, let us turn to our printed prayer sheet. And thank you very much, Crystal, for just putting the first names there since this is going to be shared. So let us pray for Alice, Art, Betsy, Bill, Bonnie, Candy, Carrie, Charlene, Cindy, Denise, Evelyn, Jeff, Jimmy, John, Josh, Karis, Lisa, Matthew, Melissa, Michael, Michelle, Prue and Bart, Richard and Sue, Steve, Steve, Thelma, Vinny, Wes, and Wink, and victims of violence everywhere in the world, and those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. With all of those shared public prayers, let us now turn inward for just a few moments in the middle of our public worship uh, to say to Jesus the things that we would choose to keep private. So just a few moments of silence before we move on. Just a few moments of silence. Spirit of God, who inspired the scriptures and gave them fulfillment in Jesus Christ, open our eyes to the gifts that you've entrusted to each one of us and show us how to work together to realize your plan of salvation for all peoples. We long to live in a world where mutual caring and support can replace greed and violence and even war. To do so, help us to respect the various forms and institutions in which you are active in the world as the one body of Christ. Help us to honor one another's gifts and to strive for the greatest of all gifts, the establishment of your reign here on earth. Help us to better know your will through our prayerful conversations. Hear our prayers that we direct to you in heaven and grant them as you alone know best. And at this point, um, let us join together in reciting the prayer that Jesus has given to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Anthony? Thank you, Anthony. So we are part of the one body of Christ, which extends around the world in a multitude of expressions. Together, we form a caring community, united in spite of our differences in appearance, understanding, and function. If others are in need, we are all called upon to help. Our ministry, this is what unites us. May our offerings help to share the good news, proclaim hope and peace, and recover among us the ability to see unity that our faith in Jesus expects. Let us as a church serve as an example of respect, overcoming division. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects, and obviously as our conditions in life allow. And your donations may be sent directly here to the church. Uh, the collection plates are empty because it's only Kathy and myself, but we do hope and pray that you will continue to support our church financially, even from home. So at this point, if Anthony, you would like to lead us in the doxology and everybody muted at home is encouraged to sing along. i 
accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed symbolically here in your sanctuary as a representation of our love for you and for all others as well. May you use these gifts for your purposes, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now again, um, singing as loudly as you would like at home, but muted, uh, we now have the, the joy of coming together for our reflecting hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And I'm going to cut off the bottom line here because you know how that part goes so you can see it a little bit better. Okay.
Thanks, Anthony. And today's reading from the Gospel of Luke is uh, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. And then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about Jesus spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Jesus unrolled the scroll, and Jesus found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then Jesus began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This past week, I sent an email to a minister, a friend of mine, who has recently been called to serve as the pastor of his old hometown church where he grew up. I wanted to kid him a little bit, and I wanted to know if he felt a little bit like Jesus returning to his old hometown synagogue in Nazareth. I wanted to know if they still remembered him as the, the youth group, I think they called it broom ball champion, when he got up to preach, or did they see the minister, or did they see that old, you know, kid who was the broom ball champion? And last Sunday, we shared here together the story about Jesus's first miracle, the one of water into wine. The evangelist John told us that this miracle was to help people believe in Jesus because John knew how hard it was to believe. And I think John realized how difficult it would be, you know, because Jesus had been so familiar for so long and how hard it would be to then accept Jesus as not the carpenter, not the neighbor, not the friend, but as somebody who was the one who, as he just said, was the anointed one. And so maybe a little bit of supernatural intervention couldn't hurt. So you turn water into wine and it gets people's attention. Again, the purpose of that is because John realized how hard it is to believe. Now, this Sunday, we hear of Jesus still really, really early in his public ministry, and he's starting to head back home to Nazareth. And Luke tells us today that Jesus arrives in town on the Sabbath, and then, as was his custom, he attended synagogue. Now, we know very little about Jesus's life in Nazareth. That's just a, a blank spot. Um, you know, we have Christmas stories. We have that one story of Jesus is 12. And then all of a sudden, he's, you know, with John the Baptist, that in-between time in Nazareth is completely black. There's nothing there. It's, it's a void. So we're told, though, that he was a carpenter. And today we learn that this carpenter worshiped on a regular basis, as was his custom, the way Luke says it. So we have no idea of what Jesus did at worship. You know, we as Christians in the year 2022, we think of Jesus as, you know, front and center, the halo. So obviously in this Nazareth synagogue, Jesus was the head of that synagogue. Jesus led everyone in that synagogue. But we don't know that. We can't assume that. Jesus was the carpenter. And, you know, archaeologists may have unearthed the first century synagogue that is in Nazareth. And the remains are the stones. And in that synagogue, there are benches along the side of stone, and they remain. You know, I don't know if I would go to the Holy Land to see, like, you know, the Bethlehem manger, because no one knows where that is. I don't know if I'd go to the Holy Land and say, you know, this is where in Cana, Jesus changed water into wine, because we don't know where that is. But if the archaeologists have discovered the stone remnants of a Nazareth first century synagogue, and the stone benches are still there, lined up along the edge of the building, the room. Jesus sat there. And man, I think I would like to do that. I would like to go to be where Jesus was, and Jesus sat, and Jesus heard the scriptures, and Jesus heard the teachings, and Jesus experienced prayer with God. I would like to be able to go sit there, because Jesus actually sat there. And I think that would be a powerful idea for me, to be able to sit where Jesus sat. 
So, but we have no idea though what he did at worship. We have no description of what he did during the service, what it was going through his mind. But I think we can imagine a little bit on the fringe. We can imagine that Jesus was inquisitive and we can also imagine that Jesus was unsatisfied. And we can imagine this because it would have been extremely rare for a local Nazareth carpenter to leave his job, to leave town behind, and to walk from all the way up in Nazareth and Galilee, go through Samaria, go down into the Judah, into the Judean area, and then from there head out into the wilderness, all to be with John the Baptist out there in the wilderness. So Jesus, if he is investing this much time and energy, we can assume that Jesus is searching for something more, and he left Nazareth to find it. So when I used to work at Yankee Candle, they used to sometimes put me in the museum area, and there was a video in the museum that played on a, a continuous repetition. Uh, so as soon as it finished, it started up again. And so my shifts there over the time, I kept hearing this video over and over and over again. And like one of those earworms, it got stuck in my head hearing it over and over. And in that video, it was said how excited people were in colonial America when visitors came into town. Sometimes this was the only way that they heard of any news beyond their local you know, town. And so it was really an exciting thing when someone new came and it could end up being the most exciting thing that happened in a week or weeks or a month or more. So it's fair for us to imagine what it must have been like when Jesus comes back home to Nazareth. Luke tells us today that wondrous reports were filtering back into Nazareth about Jesus before he even arrived. Jesus is preaching in all these other local synagogues and people are starting to whisper back in Nazareth, did you hear, did you hear, did you hear? And they're starting to hear wondrous things about Jesus. And the people of Nazareth must have been extremely excited about the prospect that their Jesus was coming back to town. So then Jesus shows up one Sabbath day. And as was his custom, he goes to the synagogue. And as was the custom, a member of the congregation would be asked to come up from their stone bench, the stone bench that you can go maybe still sit on where Jesus sat, and they would ask to be come up into the center to read from the scripture. You know, it makes perfect sense that the congregation would ask this freshly returned Jesus, the Jesus who had traveled to hear and to see this famous John the Baptist, come forward and share with us. And the leader of the synagogue hands Jesus the Isaiah scroll. Now, this would have been one of the larger scrolls because Isaiah is a full 66 chapters long. It is one of the longest books in the whole Bible. And then Luke is rather specific at this point. He tells us that Jesus unrolls this rather large scroll and that Jesus himself, he looks for one particular passage. And you just heard what Jesus read. The spirit of the Lord says Jesus is upon me because he has anointed me because God has sent me. And remember that before Jesus even arrives, there was word coming to Nazareth that everyone was praising Jesus for his teaching in their synagogues. But Jesus never teaches a word after he closes the scripture. Jesus simply rolls the scroll back up returns it to the, uh, the one in charge, the leader, and then he goes back to his bench and he sits down, quiet, never saying a word. And, it, and it's not hard to imagine that everyone in that synagogue, you know, they would have been staring at Jesus. You know, we hear all these stories about you teaching everywhere else. What are we going to get right here? What is your teaching? The people in that synagogue, they weren't waiting just to hear. They were waiting to be entertained. This was the new guy coming back. What did you hear about this John the Baptist? What did he do? What happened to you? Where have you been? What have you seen? And they wanted to know all of these things. They wanted to hear Jesus' stories of travel, and they wanted to hear what Jesus would learn and teach them. But instead, Jesus went back to his bench and sat down without uttering a word. Now with all eyes upon him, I imagine after a period of an awkward time of confused silence, Jesus finally announces, today, he says, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The congregation's response, that comes in next Sunday's gospel. So, so come back to church next Sunday. But for now, we can try to imagine how unbelievable it would be to hear this local carpenter teach this one thing, that the spirit of the Lord is upon him personally, Jesus, 
that the spirit of the Lord was inspiring him and anointing him personally, Jesus, that the spirit of the Lord was sending Jesus out into the world, him personally, Jesus. Imagine my friend, the old youth group broom ball champion returned to his childhood congregation now as their pastor. What if he dared to say something like this about himself on his first Sunday? Do you think he would be invited back for a second Sunday? I don't think it would go over very well. So John in last Sunday's gospel at least gave the people this miracle of water into wine to help them believe. Today in Nazareth, the synagogue, there's nothing of the sort. Belief is not easy. People can be tempted to be either maybe credulous or incredulous, maybe too willing to believe. Some of the things that you hear now in the news, People are just so willing to believe in some of these things that are just, just crazy. You wonder, how can they believe that? But people are credulous. And also people are incredulous. They, they, if they can't see it, they, if they don't understand mystery, if they, can't have, if they can't touch it with their hands, they refuse to believe. So there's incredulous and credulous. And it's so hard just to believe. Believing is not easy. It is a blessing for us to be here because belief is a gift from God. So Belief also is not uniform. When you have a chance, you can even do it now. You look into your Bibles. There are four different gospels in there about the one life of Jesus. And I would wager that the community that read John, they may not really have understood what was going on in the community that was reading Mark and vice versa. Mark may not understand what's going on in John's community. You also have Matthew and Luke. They're written about the same time. But I would almost promise you that the people who read Matthew would not really get what's going on with Luke's community, and Luke's community would not really get what's going on with Matthew's community. And all of this is taking place within our Bible. In Bible study just this past week, we were talking about Paul and the fact that Paul was constantly complaining about what he called Jewish Christians, because Paul was reaching out to Gentiles, and he was saying, you don't need to be kosher, you don't need to have circumcision, you don't need to go to the temple, and so he was trying to bring Gentiles into the church simply as Christians, and these Jewish Christians were very upset, and Paul complains about them continuously. Then this past week, we read the epistle to James. And James is an amazing account of social justice. It is really starting to be emphasized and read more often now because of its social justice message. But that epistle to James, those are the very people. That is the very same community that Paul was complaining about as hindering his ministry. And yet, you flip through the pages of your New Testament, and there they all are, one next to the other, equally inspired, equally authoritative, all different, and all part of our one Bible's New Testament, because believing is not easy, and believing is not uniform. This is the message of, of Paul's epistle that Donna read for us today. There's one body made up of different but important essential parts. We can't be all the same. We all must be together into that body that Jesus expects to continue his work that in his body, he began in the world of trying to make this world better, to see what is possible instead of what we think has to be. And it's hard to believe, you know, to, and, and even to celebrate that as a person, we can choose to be like Jesus and to continue that work. And maybe we can set the example of being like Jesus and being like our Bible and trying to understand that other people may be different than us, but still we need to respect them. And that's about unity, not uniformity. It's about seeing God and other people, like the arm can't say to the leg, I'm better than you, because then you can't walk anywhere, or the eye saying to the nose, I'm better than you, because then you can't smell anything. The whole body comes together for one purpose, and that's what Paul is teaching us, and that's what this week of Christian prayer for Christian unity is preaching us, that we all need to come together for Christ, whoever we are. And so with that said, I'd like Anthony, if he's able to, uh, to put up something on the screen. This is from Martin Luther King, Jr., this is what I would like to close with. That good reverend said, we have flown the air like birds and swum the sea like fishes, but have yet to learn the simple act of walking the earth like brothers. May that be our prayer, that we may learn to walk this earth like brothers and sisters. This is the only earth we got. We're all different, but that's not a reason for division and separation. We can all work together as the one 
body of Christ, all of our different gifts, all of our different understandings, all of our different beliefs coming together so we can walk this earth like brothers and sisters. And for this, may we pray on this Sunday, this ecumenical Sunday within the week of prayer for Christian unity. May we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now our closing hymn um, is Go in Peace. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you this day. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always. Celebrate and share the joy. Celebrate new life. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always. And most definitely, an amen to that sung prayer. And now uh, for our final benediction. Again, thank you all for joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for being here in the church building and running the camera there. And uh, we'll do this again next Sunday and also the following Sunday um, after February 6th. We're hoping that we can uh, come back in person. Uh, please remember as well that February 6th is our annual congregational meeting immediately after the service. And, uh, you know, that whole idea of democracy is essential to the congregational model. And I do hope that everyone will be participating in that continuing part of our worship. So now our benediction response. May the words of our mouths proclaim Christ's love for all people. May the meditations of our hearts during our time of shared worship increase our devotion to Jesus and his continuing ministry in the world through us. We have been empowered by the Spirit to share the good news through what we say and through what we do. The word of God has been the power to transform the world, not by the motive of fear of scaring people into doing these things, but by the ability to inspire us in our belief to what is possible together in Christ. The joy of faith is that our faith lets us dare to change and to grow. So let us now go forth from our homes, wherever they may be, to serve the Lord among all whom we meet in whatever we may do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.